Amy Chua may well be nuts. What kind of a mother would haul her then seven-year-old daughter's dollhouse out of the car and tell her that the dollhouse is going to be donated to the Salvation Army piece by piece if she doesn't master a difficult piano composition by the next day? What kind of a mother informs her daughter that she's garbage? And what kind of mother believes, as Chua tells readers she does, that an A- minus is a bad grade? And the only activities your children should be permitted to do are those in which they will eventually win a medal, and the medal must be gold. What kind of a mother? Why, a mother who's raising her children the Chinese rather than the Western way. In her new memoir, The Battle Hymn of a Tiger Mother, Chua recounts her adventures in Chinese parenting. And nuts though she may be, she's also become very controversial. Amy recently appeared twice on the Today Show after the Wall Street Journal published an article in which a Chinese-American Yale Law School professor compared Chinese moms to American moms. And Chua's book began to cause some great difficulties in the parenting communities. She explained how the Chinese tradition of parenting cares very little for the child's self-esteem and very much for the child's concrete achievements. The ideal mom, she argues, wouldn't tolerate a child getting anything less than straight A's, would never let a child quit something that they had begun, and would literally force a child to be perfectly disciplined in every endeavor they undertook. Very few Wall Street Journal articles ever generated so great a discussion Within the first day, the article received 2,000 comments on their blog website. Not everyone agreed with the article's depiction of the, Christ of the Chinese mom or with its praising of stern disciplinary measures. One of the most interesting comments came from a Chinese-American woman who had grown up in the very kind of home described by Chua, but this woman had been a B student child, and her big sister was the model overachieving child. And here how's, how's the woman summarizes her big sister's achievements. She got straight A's, skipped fifth grade, perfect SAT scores, varsity swim team, president of the student council, advanced level piano, Harvard early admission, an international post with the Boston Consulting Group in Hong Kong before returning to the United States for her Harvard MBA, six-figure salary, got engaged to a PhD, bought a home, got married. And according to merely human wisdom, that life has all the necessary ingredients for fulfillment, she writes. But she then continues to go on to explain how this overachieving big sister died. She committed suicide a month after her wedding at the age of 30, after hiding her depression. Certainly this is an extreme example, but sometimes extreme examples make basic principles clearer. Today, in the gospel, we are told that we are called to be light for the world and salt for the earth. But how do we achieve being the best person we can become? Our society would tell us that the best way to achieve is by clawing our way to the top, no matter what it takes. But Jesus, and certainly today in his letter, St. Paul gives us a different way to achieve our best. True meaning comes when we build our lives, as St. Paul says, not on human wisdom, but on God's power, 
on his love and mercy and goodness, not on the wisdom of the world or merely human achievements. Those achievements are not evil in themselves, but it is an illusion to think that they can fill our lives perfectly when only God can do so. So we can ask ourselves, what kind of foundation am I building on? God's power or fragile human wisdom? There are three litmus tests that can help us answer this question accurately. The first litmus test is prayer. Do you take the time out of your busy schedule to pray every day? Do you know how to pray? Do you pray better than you did a year ago? If other things, even good things, continuously crowd personal heartfelt prayer out of your daily life, then you can be sure that you're not building your life on God's power. In order to know God, we have to spend time with him as with any good friend, time conversing with him, talking, and listening. Too often, I think, our prayer time is taken up by what telling God what we need and what we want, as if God doesn't already know. I know all of us live very hectic lives, and sometimes I think people feel that if they spend time in silent prayer, that somehow they're wasting time. Let me ask you a question. Do you commute to work? How long is the drive? I'd encourage you to turn off the MP3 player or the iPod or the radio and talk to God instead. And I can guarantee you, you'll arrive at work, or if you do it on the way home, you'll arrive at home with a lot less anxiety, a lot more settled. Sometimes your alone time in the car, at least for me it is, the only solitude I get during the day. So use it wisely. The second litmus test is obedience. Christ's path of redemption was traveled through obedience to his Father's will, even to the point of dying on the cross. And as his followers, we are called also to be obedient to the will of God, especially when it's hard. So ask yourself, do you follow the Ten Commandments and allow the Beatitudes to shape your way of life? or do you habitually just do your own thing? Are you obeying the church teachings regarding the tough issues of our day, like abortion, contraception, stem cell research, immigration reform, divorce, remarriage, and every Catholic's duty to be an evangelist? Do you even know the reason behind our church's teachings? Obedience is a truly fundamental Christian virtue. If I build my life without God's help, then I am certainly doomed to failure. Being light for the world and salt for the earth means being God's light, not my own, not bringing my ideas, but being a person who brings Christ to the world. I must bring Christ to my workplace, to my home, and to all of my relationships. And I do that by allowing God to be at the center of my life. And we have to stop trying to control every situation and allow God room to work in us. And that's not always easy because we like to think of ourselves as independent and self-sufficient. But the gospel calls us to interdependence and a life lived in union with God and others. The third litmus test would be the sacraments. If you look forward and prepare yourself to receive Christ in the Eucharist every Sunday, and if you make use of the amazing sacrament of reconciliation on a regular basis, that's a sure sign that you are building your life on God's power and not wisdom, because we meet Christ in the sacraments. It is Christ that enlivens us. Prayer, obedience, and the sacraments. As we continue to pray at Eucharist this evening, 
let us truly ask God to enlighten our hearts, to show us how we can better live these virtues more intelligently and actively, that we can build our lives not on human wisdom, but on God's power. Each of us have been enlightened by Christ through our baptism, and today we are called to reveal that true wisdom of the Lord to our world. That wisdom is based not on great intellect, as St. Paul says, but on the power of God, not by earthly achievements, but by allowing God to work. If you want to be light and salt for the world, then allow God to do it with you.